we know that contractors are spending so much on driving leads. You know, whether you're investing in SEO, your online reviews, a referral program, Google local service ads, your website, you name it. Like this is expensive and you cannot afford to fall down on the next step and not maximize that return on your investment. Put that coffee down. I'm not here to waste your time, okay? I certainly hope you're not here to waste mine. So I'm gonna keep this short. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. The most valuable commodity I know of is information. Wouldn't you agree? Coffee's for closers only. Well, hello there, friends. Welcome back to the Behind Your Back podcast with me, Bradley Hartman. In this show, it's our mission to help you lead better and sell more in the construction industry and have more fun doing it. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Capital One Trade Credit. If you, my friend, are interested in growing top line revenue while decreasing risk, that's right, more revenue, less risk. Seems like a good little combination there. And you want to do that by leveraging a state-of-the-art digital platform that makes it easier for your customers to buy from you? Well, my friends, you would be interested in talking to the folks at Capital One Trade Credit. Now, one of the big initiatives that we have going on in our companies is a little bit of consolidation. So over the next 90 days or so, you will see and you will hear that we are doing some rebranding that I'm excited about, which is long overdue. So I've had my head in this marketing and brand management space for quite some time and uh, really excited about what's to come, which is why I was really excited to have this individual on the guest. It's Laura Nelson. She's the VP of marketing at Signpost. Signpost helps contractors in the construction community respond instantly, simplify communications, and build credibility. Now, Laura Nelson graduated from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Pop quiz. What's her mascot? Yeah, I didn't know idea what the hell this was. It's the Tartans. T-A-R-T-A-N-S. The Tartans. What does it look like? Uh, it looks like a shield with a miniature schnauzer in it. It's pretty phenomenal. Next time in Pittsburgh, I will buy a pennant for sure. And then she got her master's, her MBA at the University of Michigan. Mascot? They don't have one. They're the worst university in the world. Let's keep going. So Laura worked her way up at different firms all in the marketing segment, is now the VP of marketing at Signpost. And in this conversation, we talk about a number of different things, all that I think are really helpful as we build our own reputation, improve our own brand management, and do it with less effort. So we talk about some common themes, but I think Laura offers a unique perspective that will be really valuable to you. So we talk about how you can automate reviews, which is something that we absolutely, on my team, need to do a better job of. We talk about leveraging text and chat, how these are long-term trends that are happening and how we need to make sure we take advantage of them and make them more consistent. We talk about very strategic things about how to make the most of your marketing budget, regardless of what it is, and more tactical elements, like how to build an effective campaign or what not to do. So Laura was a fantastic guest. I learned a lot from her. I'm excited for her to share her insights with you. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Miss Laura Nelson of Signpost. So, Miss Laura Nelson, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thrilled you're here, uh, mainly because we always do a kind of a pre-podcast call. And if you could, it's around here somewhere. I just made so many notes and just, I felt like some of the things you were casually talking about was absolutely critical and so insightful. So I was excited to have you on the show to bring those up again to a larger audience and then dig a little bit deeper. But I think where I want to start is maybe with an observation I've had with my clients. And one of the concerns that I've had is from March of 20 through, depending on what state they're in uh, largely and how they kind of view about COVID in general, maybe that went on for 12 months, maybe a little bit more to 18 months. But for most of my clients now, the insights and the capabilities that they picked up during kind of those first call it 12 to 18 months of COVID, curbside pickup, mm -hmm. leveraging chat features, 
thinking differently about how to communicate with text. So many of them are just getting rid of those and kind of going back to the way we used to do it a la, you know, Q4 2019. And all of this is really your expertise. So maybe just speaking to this crowd in general uh, that I'm concerned about, maybe what are some of the things that you guys are really focused on or how would you kind of talk to this audience? Sure. I think the underlying thing that you are addressing is that, you know, contractors adapt their behaviors to and tools and technologies and so forth to meet the needs of the consumers, meet their expectations in a new environment. And now that the world has opened up and, you know, it is a little easier to do business, we kind of know what we're dealing with when it comes to COVID. We are vaccinated, things like that you are seeing contractors kind of revert back to the way things have been. The risk with that, as we all know, is that consumers have moved on and you know the bar for their expectations and service level continues to go up. And what I mean by that really is that people are used to doing things in a certain way, maybe texting with the contractor, using chat tools to schedule other services, if they are uh, using an app to do something that they didn't do before, Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to revert to the old way of doing things. Like Those things make their lives easier. And if done well, they will make the lives of contractors and the operations of their businesses more effective too. So there is a real risk of getting left behind. You know, if you if you dismiss or get rid of these tools and technologies, um, you are not keeping pace with the customer that you ultimately want to work with. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I just try to do is, you know, take a step back and whether we're reading it in articles in Fast Company or Wired or, you know, sports magazines, wherever we're getting our information, understanding our world, are like, where are the arrows generally pointed, right? And I don't think they're away from increased automated online communication, you know, chat features. It's not pointing away from e-commerce, although the construction industry is slow to that, right? Is there any argument against kind of these big general trends or other other ones where you say not only that, but whether it's, I don't know, to the degree that you guys are really talking about AI with your core customers, but these are the, the big trends that I think are all pointed this way. Is there a counter argument that you might back up maybe that someone who's listening might have who'd say, eh, I'm not sure if this stuff is going to stick around? I think it's important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. When you're talking about something like automation, yeah. when I talk to contractors about that, they're like, whoa, whoa, you know, I talk to all of my leads and all of my customers. It's really important for that personal touch. So if we're talking about a tool that helps to automate something, and I'll give you an example uh, for signposts, one of our features, if someone calls your business line, you miss the call, it automatically sends a text back to the homeowner, whoever's calling in, right? Yep. Um, so that, that's super useful for acknowledging that message. But I wouldn't throw away the baby part of it, which is the authenticity. You've got to make sure your brand and you know how you want to speak to your customers is still embedded. And so like that messaging is really important. How is it customized to how you deal with your clientele on a day-to-day basis? You know, it shouldn't be just some, we receive your message, we'll call you back. Give it some flair to, you know, how you want your customers to be talked to and as you like, and how you as a consumer would want to hear back from a business, right? Yeah. You probably don't want that auto message, but if you know something's automated, but has, you know, sounds like it's coming from a human that can go a really long way. Yeah. It's funny. The the stat that you guys had here, it is, this is from your website that 78% of jobs go to the businesses that respond first. This, for many of our listeners who are specifically in sales or work around salespeople, will tell you, it sounds like it's like 20% low because part of what the best 
salespeople do is just get back immediately. And they'll often yeah. find if they can get back with that speed and acknowledgement in today's environment with backordered material and supply chain issues, et cetera, that is so powerful. However, to then think about the automated portion of it is that is fascinating. So I'm going to ask you to do something that I don't believe I've ever asked anyone on the show to do before. Here's what I want. I want the sales pitch. What's the sales pitch here? Because you mentioned one of the objections is personalization. Because I think if you miss a call and then the text message goes out immediately, I read that. I'm yeah. like, hell yes. I want that. I think our people will want that. So give me the sales pitch on there. Or maybe what are the other objections that you might hear beyond the, well, Laura, part of what we do is make people feel warm and fuzzy and we're smart and we help them along the way. They need the personalization. But on that feature alone, maybe walk them through your sales pitch a little bit there. Sure. Um, this is all designed around the concept that Signpost believes that you should never miss a lead for this exact reason okay. that you know the majority of buyers are going to the company that responds first. And notice, you know, that stat does not say the person who calls them personally first, right? Or the person that gives them a you know an estimate first. It is response time, acknowledgement, getting them on your uh, scheduler, right? Like some contractors aren't even using a scheduler for estimates. And that takes a lot of the friction out of coordination with the homeowner. Right. But all of that to say, like, we know that contractors are spending so much on driving leads, you know, whether you're investing in SEO, your online reviews, a referral program, Google local service ads, your website, you name it, like this is expensive and you cannot afford to fall down on the next step and not maximize that return on your investment. So it's really important to have the tools and technologies and processes in place to ensure that you are in contention mm -hmm. to win that business. Because a lot of homeowners, uh, they're calling more than one of you guys, right? They want yeah. to compare and contrast. And that first impression is everything. Yeah, it's interesting because when I thought about this, I think my own expectations and my own behaviors will say, I'm quicker to call multiple people. And what I'm really mm -hmm. looking for initially is probably not an immediate solution. Most of the issues I have around the house and I need a contractor, talk to somebody, aren't, you know, well, occasionally. It's it's summer here in Dallas. So it might be 105 and my AC went out, but we try to get ahead of that. Yeah. But most of the time, it's I want an acknowledgement. And I bought something actually related to my car and I put in the order and it said, hey, we'll follow up with you. And it went like six days. And every day I'm like, I'd rather just see how long this goes because normally that response time's immediate. So I think to your point, I think that's powerful when you say, you know, the response isn't, it's going to be the owner named Jim or Sandra to call yeah. you personally. It's just say, hey, yeah. sorry, I missed you. I know you're there. I will get back to you. It's that acknowledgement that I think is more powerful. So yeah, I think, I think that's, that's interesting. So let me ask you, how long, Sam, listen to this. I'm like, Laura, you're persuasive. I'm in. You've addressed kind of the two of the major objections I have right now. How long does it take to get set up? If you said, we know that a certain X number of calls daily are going by us because we're so busy, but we can acknowledge their response time. How long does it take to get set up? Like on sign posts? Yes, exactly. Yeah, not all, long at all. Like you can, there's a self-serve onboarding platform that okay. takes five to seven minutes. When we talk about the telephone, like we do have an onboarding appointment, a half hour with our team to okay. make sure that, you know, we've got the right forwarding and you've got the knowledge of the, you know, we have a toggle that literally you use from the mobile app to forward phone calls, things like that. Okay. But it's not a long process. Where contractors fall down is like they get excited and, you know, we're already in the busy season, right? Um, they just like, don't always follow up immediately to get it set up and get off to the races and then things can stall. So, you know, it's, it's very much a partnership. Like we're here to help people, you know, get up and running and make sure that they have the right configuration that works for the business. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, I don't do that very often where I literally say, just, I don't think I've ever done, just give me your sales pitch. But I think this, this touched a nerve and this is 
really on point to a lot of the conversations that I'm having. So let's do this. Let's zoom out just a little bit. Let's talk about reviews. We talk about word of mouth. We know good reviews are better than bad reviews. We know a lot of good reviews singing our praises are better, you know, than bad ones that are out there. Probably video testimonials are better than audio, which are better than copy uh, or text. Mm -hmm. Tell me though, are there, what are you talking about with your customers or thinking about doing differently when it comes to reviews that might be non-obvious? I think that this is where automations just are the way to go. Okay. Right. And what I mean by that is like reviews, like every company needs to be investing in a process to get feedback from every customer up on Google, Yelp, Facebook, you name it, whatever these platforms are that are most important in your market. That's table stakes these days. If you're not doing it, your competitors are, you're missing out on jobs. Um, That's step one. I think where contractors sometimes fall behind in this process is just just that, not creating a process okay. and not automating the process. So you know, they may see like, hey, this guy, he's killing it in my market, like in local search and has hundreds of reviews. Like, I, I don't know how to get ahead there. It's probably because that person is integrating a solution like Signpost with their CRM. They're using automations um, like Zapier to automatically follow up once you know a job is paid and complete. And they're taking the human element out of it completely. So it's always great when you finish a job and say, hey, like reviews are really important to us. Please let us know how we did. We'll send you a text or an email that personalizes the ask, you know, you get eye contact, you get buy-in from a homeowner in this case, but then you've got to let the technology do the work and make it easy for the person on the other end so that like they're on their device, they get that text, they get that email. um, They're in the mode, right? It's not about like, Hey, we're going to send you a paper survey, drop it in the mail or even making a video, it's great, but it's a heavy lift and it doesn't always help your local SEO, you know, getting it in the inbox or sending a text even better because over, you know, text has a four times uh, read rate and open rate rather than email. So think about how many texts you leave unread versus versus emails, yeah. right? Meet that consumer where they are and make it easy. I think that's that's an insight to the obvious, which is something that I, I certain is as soon as you said that, that immediately resonates with my own behavior. You see that little mm-hmm. little blue dot or whatever the hell it is on my phone. I'm checking all of those texts. And yeah, I'm yeah. seeing kind of more spam come in there, but it's it's a far different environment compared to my email inbox, which I literally do not have on my phone. So I don't fall yeah. into the trap of going in there. So you said that's a, it's a four time read rate between text versus email. Right. Yeah. I said that poorly, but the open rate on emails, you know, it's as our email inboxes get flooded with marketing messages, we are, we are less likely to read them. Yeah. Email open rate, say, say marketing messages are somewhere in the low 20%, right? On average. Text messages, on the other hand, are north of 90% when it comes to open rate. And, you know, that makes a lot of sense, especially as you're thinking about which ones you opted into, who you're expecting to hear from. Um, It's important to follow the rules. So if you're texting someone back, you do have to have these certain disclosures that are protecting your business from TCPA regulations. However, when you use the right tools, for that, you have access, you make it easy for yourself, for uh, the person on the other end of the line. Yeah. So let me ask you this. If someone's listening, how might they think about the potential negative ramifications of asking for more reviews? And I had a recent experience. I was in Santa Monica. I was at a hotel that shall rename nameless for yeah. obvious reasons. I did not have a good experience. There were all sorts of issues. The the AC kept on going in and out. It, it wasn't clean. It just wasn't a good experience. And as soon as I left, literally it was like on the plane flying home, I got a text and it said, would you like to leave a review? And I thought, as a matter of fact, I would. And I generally do not give many bad reviews. I don't know, maybe a couple a year, but this was so timely. 
And I was so annoyed. I did. And I didn't give them zeros, but I gave them what I think was accurate, which was below average. And I was wondering how might those people who are probably working hard that are working in a hotel on the other end, get that and how they think about it. And is there some manager saying, saying like, see, this is why we shouldn't get these reviews. How might, you know, you say, well, true, but here's another way to think about that. Yeah. Basically like the, the most unhappy people are going to be the first ones to go to your page. So if you're a business that, you know, where reviews are important and you're not doing anything, chances are a higher proportion of negative reviews are going to land on your page. Okay. Makes sense. You need to ask everyone, like if you're in business, chances are the majority of your customers are happy. So you need to build this into your process and ask everyone for a review. Now, if you are a little concerned that you might not get the best feedback and, you know, that can arise when, say, you've got a job, you've got lots of different touch points between homeowner and and your team, maybe something bad happened and you're just not sure the way, you know, how things will work out on a, an on online review. Sure. Um, there are tools like signposts. You can actually ask them first for feedback. That's all internal. Okay. Right. And then, you know, get the feedback that way. And then you have the choice. Like, do I later want to send a review request? Like, Oh, this person is happy. I can send a review request, you know, in a few days now that we're in the clear. Okay. Or like you can just, you know, you can just collect internal feedback. Obviously that doesn't help you for your marketing purposes, but it is helpful to know. What we have found, like we have experimented with both approaches. Do you send a private feedback request first to follow up with the review request versus just send the review request? People are just as likely to leave a review. It's it's just as likely to be positive if they just get the review request. Okay. Um, the reason for that is people get review fatigue. If they fill out that private feedback ahead of time um, or before a review, they, they may think they've already left the review right. in the survey. So it's, it's tough to ask them twice. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Let's talk about campaigns. I think I am probably somewhat representative of a lot of our listeners. We know what campaigns are. We feel, yeah. we understand when we are in a campaign for someone else, many of them often don't lead to a whole lot of value. And uh, in some cases, I think in most cases, we are not executing those well. I know personally, we are not. This is something that we want to get better yeah. at. Talk to me about what are the highest performers doing with campaigns to consistently deliver value, whether or not that leads to a new customer or not? Yeah, I think that you kind of started to answer that in the question about delivering value. Think about all the campaigns you get from the brands that you're signed up with, right? The ones that are low value to us as readers are just constant like coupons, promotions. Example of that Bed Bath & Beyond sends just discounts and coupons. I'm on there so I can have a coupon at the ready when I go into that store. But it's a an otherwise low value message that lands in you know my third tier inbox the ones that i do value are educational that position the sender as someone who has expertise who has um, the ability to help me when that need arises right so if you're sharing if you're a builder for example and you know you're sharing new trends in kitchen remodels and showing off some of your great work and and talking about um, why a certain feature has, you know, has some value, why it's popular, how it creates more space in your kitchen. Just as an example, um, you know, that, that kind of plants a seed in the recipient's mind versus like, Hey, we do free estimates. Well, a lot of us like already expect that. So it's not, of value um, when it comes to a marketing message, you know, I would rather get some inspiration. I would rather understand, you know, the expertise that say a builder has, you know, when it comes to thinking about my next project. Yeah. No, that's a great point. So let's think about this, this cliche that's kind of always been in marketing. I don't know who it's attributed to. 
seems like everything these days is attributed to Abraham Lincoln on the internet. I don't think he said it, but it's something along the lines of the problem with the marketing budget is we know we're going to waste half of it. The problem is we don't know which half we're wasting. So <laughs> what advice do you have on maybe things not to do when we think about a marketing budget as we, let's fast forward, we're starting to look into 2023. I, I love that quote. And I think it applies to just about everyone because something yeah. that worked in the past might not work today. Yeah. Um, something that didn't work when you revisit it with a different perspective, different execution, whatever the case may be, can work in the future. That's what makes the whole function so challenging, right. <laughs> but, um, you know, keeps us as marketers intrigued. I think that the thing to keep in mind is like a consistent way of measuring your return on investment, okay. right? And, you know, depending on what your sales cycle is, that window of evaluation, maybe a month, it may be a quarter, et cetera, but you cannot improve it if you're not monitoring and measuring the output of those marketing dollars. So I think that's the most important thing to keep in mind in order to determine, yeah, what what's working for us and what's not working for us. So is that, would that just be a real simple return on net revenue or, you know, basically saying, hey, we're, we are allocating X dollars for marketing. What's the revenue return on that? Is, is that the simplest? Are there other metrics where you'd yeah, say, hey. I think, you know, how we look at it, I'm in a software business, so it's slightly different than contracting, right? But um, you really need to get your your arms around like what does a what's a new customer worth okay. to you, right? And what are you willing to pay to acquire that customer? And then taking a look at okay, so how many leads is that generating? You know, how many are you able to close, right? Because then you'll get to that customer acquisition number, and you know if it applies in your you know, certain contractors will have a lifetime value where maybe that customer comes back. Yep. Others will have, you know, maybe it's just one big job, one build. So, you know, it can depend, but getting a grasp on those numbers, for me, I'm looking at it monthly. What am I spending on leads across different channels? What is our close rate across them? How do I, you know, move my money around, mm -hmm. right, to get the most out of it that I think I can and, you know, another piece of advice that I was thinking about in terms of monitoring, managing, like if something's not working, don't let it go on too long. Cut your ties, put the money somewhere else or, you know, save it for when you have a, a better idea or need, but don't run something for six months or a year if it's not working out in, you know, the first three months. That's not to say everything's going to pay off in three months. There are some longer term plays, but you know, there are some others that you'll know fairly quickly what type of quality leads are getting out of them and you know whether you're able to close them. Yeah. I have a whole rant. I will I won't bore you with it or our audience at this point, but it, <laughs> coming from the software world, kind of thinking about customer acquisition cost and long lifetime mm -hmm. value of a customer. I think those are so critical, but they are absolutely fundamental to running any sort of business. And sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, I'll ask a salesperson who's, I'm dying to meet Laura Nelson. I would do anything. She's the ideal customer. And I'd say, okay, how much would you pay me if I knew her? And I could guarantee a face-to-face -face meeting for 20 minutes. How much would you pay me for that? You're like, right. I don't know, like 500 bucks, like $500. Do you realize how much money you would have to spend to like totally blow Laura's mind to give her 20 minutes. It's probably a far less number than $500. But for some reason, I think when we think about the construction industry in general or contractors or lumber dealers or whatever, we somehow we forget that. And I was like, do you realize how thoughtful and surprising you can be with a hundred dollars, let alone 500. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is what happens. I get rolling. I get excited. I'm going to run down this rabbit hole. I, I'm not going to do that. Um, you were an intern at Ford Motor Company when you were getting your MBA. What do mm -hmm. you recall taking away from that as an insight or an experience that still either you think about today or really shaped who you are as a marketer? Um, that is a great question. I haven't thought about that internship in a while just because it took place in 2007. So <laughs> it's been 15 years. That's hard to believe, right? 
I had never worked at a company that large. Right. So that was a huge uh, shift for me. And I was based in the chief marketing office, but I had kind of stakeholders throughout the organization in my short time there. I was awestruck by how they get anything done with such a large company and bureaucracy. <laughs> can imagine. I think the biggest takeaway for me was that I didn't want to work at as large an organization again. <laughs> that's, that's one. Well, we were just talking about in our team of five, soon to be six, that somehow this bureaucracy was creeping up. And I think that's for all organizations, let alone one that has, you know, I don't even know, 50,000, uh -huh. 100,000 workers, right? How you make things simple to get done. So what did you study at Carnegie Mellon? You got your BFA, fine arts. What were you, what were you doing? What were you making? What, what was happening with these arts that were fine? What were you doing? Uh, I went to art school or university with a great art program. Okay. Um, we had to learn everything. I focused on painting, drawing, and printmaking, but I learned how to arc weld. I learned wood shop. I learned mixed media, all performance art, all the kind of weird things one can pick up in in school just because that was part of the uh, curriculum. I had a great experience there. I still practice my art, but it does not pay the bills, unfortunately. So I've had to leverage some of that knowledge and some of the transferable skills in my career as a marketer. But yeah, that's that's where I got my start. That's fascinating. Yeah, because I often talk to folks and they will downplay if they, oh, I didn't come from a construction management background. I didn't do this. I'll say often, I think the most effective people they came and they have a different perspective. They learned a craft and a or a different way to think or a different way to act that brings an entirely unique perspective that I think is, is fascinating. Are there any sort of principles or things that you say, I pick this up from doing something that is more focused on art that helps me as a marketer see the world differently? I think um, thinking critically, certainly, and putting your ideas out there. Um, the reason for that is in art school, you are constantly in critiques. So mm. there's, you know, assignments. And at the end of however long you have for this assignment, then the next three hour class is all about showing your work, talking about it a little and, and allowing your classmates to provide their feedback on the concept, the execution, et cetera. It's, it's a lot. It's hard to put yourself out there. Yeah. And um, sometimes it doesn't go well, but uh, it is a great experiment and great foundation really in separating yourself from your work and not taking things too personally. And, you know, it's really hard not to sometimes, but at the end of the day, like I've, I've learned really not to take things too seriously. Right. You know, chances are this, you know, this campaign I worked on or, or this podcast record, I recorded, it's not my life's work. It's just one small piece <laughs> of, of getting the word out about yeah. you know, the company, how we work with people, et cetera. And so like, if it doesn't go perfectly one time or another, it's not a big deal. It's not, you know, an indictment of who I ha am as a person. So I think that would be one of the big lessons of, from being in that environment. Oh, wow. Yeah, the self-awareness that I am not my work and that, that is different yeah. or what I'm advocating for or what I believe in, I can still put it out there and say, I think this is what we should do for our business or for this customer or this prospect. But then also stand back and have the self-awareness and confidence in yourself, but your team that we can give them permission to give candid feedback and say, that's okay. I'm not going to bat a thousand. This could be an entirely separate podcast, but... Uh, yeah, I know it's easier said than done, yeah. though, because especially entrepreneurs, business owners are so attached to the work, right? And so ingrained, and it's really hard to step away. My parents were local business owners. I get it. I get that singular identity. And I know that it comes, it's reflected through sometimes in online reviews. It's personal. Yes. Oh my God, this is an indictment of my work and my people. You got to remember that people on the other side who are writing reviews sometimes have bad days. And sometimes it's not about you. Yep. Like literally sometimes a review is not even about you or your business, but yeah. other times it is like, there's a lot more below the surface that has nothing to do yep. with the, the job that you did for them. 
Yeah. One of the things I want to make sure we hit on, and then I'm going to kind of tee up signposts for you to let everyone know where they can find you. But uh, I was really interested in your contractor's corner. So you had, uh-huh. it looks like you had 17 episodes and numbers episode 17 was something I was very excited to click on. And it was called mm-hmm. Good, Better, Best, Giving Your Customers Choices, which I think is something we all know. But I'm always talking to these sales professionals that we coach. They're like, I don't know, I gave them a proposal, exactly what he asked for. And I'm like, anyway, giving them options. So you're giving them a choice of yeses is powerful. Tell me about Contractor's Corner in general and, and maybe just a little bit kind of a behind the scenes how it works. Because when I clicked on it, I just didn't get the video. There was another step in there. So maybe walk me through the mechanics there and how it's effective for you. Yeah. Um, so the, the whole idea of the video series was born out of this um, desire to educate people and get great content out there. So I talked earlier about you know what makes a successful campaign. It's providing true value and you know real knowledge. So that's the the concept behind this video series. It's, you know, we have lots of smart people in our network. We interview them just as you are now, right? Like giving them a platform to talk about something very specific, right? Um, So if you go to signpost.com, hit the resources tab, you can scroll down to contractors corner and you'll see things like, you know, how do you provide good, better and best options for your customers? Right. Like people sometimes need the choices, you know, depending on the, you know, the type of business you're in. Right. Not yeah. quite, not always. apply. You know, we have others about like scaling your business from one to five million. Right. How do you how do you get past a certain point and drive more growth, transforming your sales team into trusted advisors? Right. Like how do you approach you know, the sales situation in a way that you, know, you are on this side of the homeowner rather than like in an adversarial or like sales pitch environment. Yeah. So anyways, there's lots of different topics around like just consultative good information that typically, you know, people on our network or our par- partners provide. And you talked about, you know, uh, how to get access to these videos. You may notice that if you, you click on one of the videos, um, uh, pop up comes up, you know, we ask for information, like who's opting into this information? Are, are they a good candidate for further information? So uh, we call that gating content. Okay. So we, we collect information, then we put that um, person onto our subscribers list so that, you know, we can follow up when a new episode comes out, or when we have another piece of content to share. So you'll see that, you know, in all types of businesses, and I encourage contractors to do that as well, not just when people are, you know, requesting a quote or information, right? Think about like, you know, do you have a newsletter of prior customers and of leads built up so that you can nurture them, Mm -hmm. warm them up and get them in a you know better spot to understand you, your team, your business when they're ready to buy. Yeah, got it. Well, no, I thought it was just really well done because there was several things there. I just flipped through, I'm like, interested, 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 and then clicked on it and I'm like, okay. But and again, I think if I was going to click on this and I can see multiple episodes that I think would be valuable for me, I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination that you guys will continue to get better and say, we're going to create more of this content to help you in the future. And there's the value on a long enough timeline. Hey, hopefully you know who we are. Maybe we work together. Maybe we don't, but I'm going to be delivering value every step of the way, which is really one of those, one of those pillars that we're always talking about deliver value first. And uh, I thought it was a neat technique. So I would encourage everyone there to go check it out. So maybe let's just close there again, maybe just make it super obvious where people can learn more about you, Laura and signpost. Uh, visit signpost.com. Okay. Easy as that. <laughs> well, cool. Well, Hey, this is really helpful. I got another page full of notes and this is, this is I think something that even if you you've really been dedicated to this and maybe you're working with a third party to help you do it, This is, it's such a living, breathing activity to really think about how we market and improve our reach and consistently deliver really delighted customers. So even if you're doing it really well, it's always good to kind of sharpen the saw. But I think for folks like us who look back and say, 
we we need to do better. We can do better. And this was really helpful for us doing that. So Laura, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bradley. I appreciate it. All right, then. How did that go? Hopefully you enjoyed my conversation with Miss Laura Nelson. I would really recommend you check out Signpost webpage here for the Contractor's Corner. Not only is there really valuable content, but I think it'd be helpful for you to see the mechanism that another company is using by bringing together valuable content and then using that to generate more leads and ultimately build closer relationships with those they serve. And this had me thinking about some of the content that Ryan Scaife and Lezer Lumber, they're creating. They could just as equally take these small bite-sized pieces of educational content on different products and different services and put them behind some sort of gate to generate more leads. Now, if you talk to Ryan, I'm sure he'd say, we want to make these free for the very reason we want as many people as possible to watch them. So we do not want to put them behind the gate. But again, I think these are options that you get to consider. And as more and more of us are creating content, for us, we're generating a lot more video-based content, not only on every podcast, but also on our own. And right now, it's not. We're just putting it on YouTube and we're asking people to subscribe and hopefully help more people. But on a long enough timeline, might we put some of that behind a gate? I don't know. But these are all options. So I want to make sure you guys are thinking about different ways that you can use these tactics to ultimately improve your own brand management. So speaking of brand management, Let's talk about Capital One Trade Credit. They're managing their brand, all right. They're growing, how? They are helping people like you make it easier for their customers to buy from them. As we're talking about these digital platforms and e-commerce to make it easier to text or chat, guess what? Capital One Trade Credit has all of that. And they have an entire team behind them to make it easy for you to implement. So if you're interested in increasing cash flow while decreasing risk, check out Capital One Trade Credit. That's all we've got, my friends. Again, if you are not subscribed to, hey, this podcast, don't pick and choose. Just subscribe to them all. Don't miss a show. And then uh, check us out on YouTube, Behind Your Back Sales. We are putting clips of each podcast there with me and my guest. The goal there is to take a long-ish podcast episode, put it into chunks to make it easier to share these insights among your team and obviously, the visual is a little bit different and better in certain ways. If you're not driving, don't drive and watch us. It's a bad move. But that way, you can get the visual as well. So subscribe to our YouTube channel at Behind Your Back Sales. My friend, as always, thank you for listening. I know there are lots of other content and people that are competing for your attention. Thank you for investing some of it here. That's all we've got. We're going to close out like we always do. You, my friend, you were owed nothing deliver value first. Make it a great week.